I was in 12th standard and I was head girl. There was a rumor that two house captains had pressured two junior students to run slowly in the cross country race so they, the house captains, could win. These two house captains were dynamic, high achieving, fun, popular students. One of them was my closest friend. What should I do? The challenge as I saw it that day, or the question as I saw it that day, was, is friendship more important than truth and justice? At issue as I saw it was the principle of fair play on which sports at this school and our society is based. The student government system at Cathedral, with the principle as its guide, is the best ethical training. Something that I feel, and I'm sure you all do, is so vital to creating a better India and a better world. As I went through life from Cathedral to Dartmouth College, to five different newspapers and to write a book, the dilemma of that time remained a guiding force for me, always bringing the question to my mind, could I, should I stand up for the principles of truth and justice? At a global scale, these questions couldn't be more relevant. Routinely, countries turned a blind eye to misbehavior by their allies. The consequences of this behavior is enormous. Back at Cathedral, I was outraged back then as head girl to think that two of my peers had bullied juniors. I saw them telling the juniors to run slow as an abuse of power because the juniors I felt had no choice but to run slow. And so I decided to bring this to the attention of our principal, Colonel Simeon. Colonel Simeon called us prefects into his office and he directed us to spend several days deliberating and investigating on whether the two house captains had actually abused their power and what should be done about this. In the days that followed, some who didn't like the house captains used this as a chance to humiliate them. I was horrified. Others who loved these two refused to believe they'd done anything wrong. It was the fault of the juniors, they argued, for listening to the house captains. They blamed the victims. At length, the day of reckoning came. All of us prefects were seated around the rim of the principal's office. The two accused captains sat silently amongst us, their eyes trained on the ground. The principal went around the room one by one, asking us whether we thought the two captains had abused their power. The first person he called on was me. I was torn. I looked over at my friend who looked in agony. His agony made worse by the glee of some of those who didn't like him. And yet, with the principle as my guide, I felt an allegiance to the truth. And so I answered as honestly as I could. Yes, I said, 
the house captains had indeed bullied two juniors. They had abused their power. The principal was compassionate with the two of them that day. I can't remember what punishment he gave them, but it was light. He believed that in the, ex the experience of being judged by their peers, they had learned the lesson that they needed to learn. And the reason I tell you this story today is because that experience has been so resonant in my life and it has served as a guide during some of the most difficult moments of the past 30 years. I wasn't always sure that I made the right decision that day. I often tormented myself asking, was it right to bring this rumor to the principal's attention? Did I violate the principles of friendship that day? Is it really right to put truth and justice ahead of friendship? When I went to college from school, I found myself drawn in to campus protests against racism in South Africa. So I joined a group of students as a freshman in college. I joined this group protesting the college investing its endowment in companies doing business in South Africa. So we built huts on the at the center of the college campus to protest their investing in South Africa, to protest the college. A group of right-wing conservative students showed up at night and bashed down the huts. So we students, in protest of them bashing down the huts, took over the college president's office and demanded <laughs> that he punish them. I found myself seated on the steps of the administration building, listening to the leader of our group giving a speech. This leader was one of my closest friends. And as I listened to the speech, my lessons from cathedral began to ring loud in my ears as I heard my friend and the student leader demanding that the students who bashed down the huts be immediately expelled from college. And I began to ask myself, was it fair and was it right for us fighting for justice for black South Africans to demand that another group of people be treated unjustly? Was it fair to demand that they be immediately expelled without trial from the college campus? I was too junior then as a freshman to affect the direction of the group or the protest. But what I could do that day was affect where I stood. So without a word, I got up and I made that protest one less person strong that day by leaving. I went on to work at five different newspapers. Um, and always, as I'm sure you'll experience in life, you run into abusive bosses. And when I was at the Wall Street Journal, I had one such abusive boss. I tried, to, the, the abuse was that the boss would not edit our stories. So I was writing story after story, as were my colleagues, and they were getting stuck in the editing pipeline and they weren't appearing for months. It is here, it's okay. I tried to bring this to the boss's attention, begging him, beseeching him, please, can you edit our stories? My colleagues at the paper also similarly begged and wept. Finally, the lessons learned from Cathedral when I stood up for two juniors affected me and influenced me to stand up in this case for myself. And so I persuaded the other, the other colleagues of mine that we should bring 
the, our boss's attention to his boss, our boss's behavior to his boss's attention. This was a scary thing to do because he, the boss's boss could decide we were disgruntled and toss us out. But I tell you this story because it was so worthwhile. The boss's boss did what many corporations do when confronted with such information. They promoted him to a job in which he was boss only of himself. And we got a new editor. And under her leadership, the Wall Street Journal and I won numerous prizes, including the Pulitzer Prize. <laughs> I also wrote a book, The Cure, and it was about a dad who started a biotech company to develop a medicine to save his kids. And the amazing thing about it is he developed the medicine and he saved his kids' lives. But I had also heard that at times he stretched the truth to convince a big co biotech company to buy his little biotech company. And that he tried to set up a secret clinical trial behind the back of his company so his kids could get the drug. The question I confronted then was, do you gloss over the ethical transgressions of someone who's done a phenomenal job, who you like a lot, who has saved his kids? And with my experience at Cathedral as my guide, I decided, and the dad decided, no that you can only understand someone's greatness when you also scrutinize their mistakes. And the book I wrote was only powerful and resonant because it looked at the times where he compromised his responsibility as leader of a man developing a drug, as leader of a company developing a drug for all children. Because we looked at those difficult questions, the book was true and meant something to the people who read it. On a global scale, the lessons I learned at Cathedral back in 1985 are so resonant on a daily basis. Witness the way the U.S. ignored Pakistan's, what word should I use, Pakistan's condoning and encouraging of terror on its soil. And look at the consequences of that today as terrorism spreads in India and across the world. And so now when I look back on the question that tormented me for so long, is friendship more important or is truth and justice? I realize that actually they're not mutually exclusive. The house captain, who was my friend then, is my close friend today. The dad I wrote the book about not only supported me in investigating these questions about himself, but is my close friend today. And in fact, we discussed before I wrote it how important it was to investigate also the times where he made mistakes and not just focus on all the times where he was brilliant. And so when I was reporting the book and I called his colleagues and his friends asking them for interviews, they would call him and say, John, what should we tell her? And to each and every one, John would reply, just tell her the truth. I want to conclude by saying that I couldn't be more grateful 
to cathedral for the phenomenal experience of being in student government where you're given so much power and so much responsibility and you have the safe environment to test out the question of what you believe in and how far you're willing to go to stand up for the principles on which our society is based. And I would argue, I mean, for me, um, having this, these lessons helped me lead a more honest, more meaningful and more successful life. And I feel like this ethical training is something that should be emulated in India and across the world to, crea to create a society more free of corruption and to build a more just world. Thank you.